A word of warning, this series is going to make you angry. It's going to make you realize that you've spent a lot of your time in poker learning things that are wrong by copying people that you've come to know and love the content of. You have actually learned and ingrained lots of bad habits. In this series, we're going to debunk those bad poker thought processes and show you exactly what's wrong with them. Starting today with the thought process, we need protection. There are two types of thought process we're going to cover in this YouTube series. The first one is things that aren't actually terrible, like they are a thing. Protection is a thing. I like to call it denial rather than protection. I'll get to that in a minute. It is a thing, but it's very overcooked. It's overemphasized and it's used as a sufficient thought for a bet in many spots where it shouldn't be. In many of those spots, the student should actually just be checking or maybe mixing bet with check. So we're going to see why we need protection is overdone today. In future installments, we're also going to look at some thought processes where the concept mentioned isn't even a thing. Like, it's literally garbage. It's gobbledygook. It's the equivalent of the world is flat or maybe even just like a meaningless sentence with made-up words and made-up sentence structure. Today's concept protection is kind of a thing, but it's massively overdone. Let's take a look at why and what better way to start than by diving into a very common spot. We all love being in a single race pot. Small blind versus big blind, this is one of the most awkward situations on the poker table. Um, we're going to assume this is a cash game, 100 big blinds deep. Hero has 10 of clubs, 10 of diamonds, and villain has two unknown cards with question marks on them. 974 is your flop, and we have the choice of betting 33% pot or checking. Of course, we could bet bigger here as well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But for now, we're going to choose between one of these two lines. What do you guys think you should do? Pause the video and tell me. Now, I've kind of given the game away here on pause. I've kind of said protection is overdone. Therefore, if your thought process ran as I'm going to bet the flop because I need protection, you have flunked the first class of this YouTube series. Protection is a thing. It does exist. And I'm going to show you guys a little pile output now that's going to show you the effect of that in action. And you'll see how minimal this effect actually is. So this is a betting range for the flop. A betting strategy you can see that when we are out of position here as a small blind and we have pocket tens we are mixing this roughly 50 50 depending on suits don't listen to this the solver's stupid don't take into account how often it's doing it with a ten of hearts ten of clubs who cares the main thing we care about here is the ev and in the theory of the game right in objective equilibrium we would call equilibrium the state of affairs where no one is making any exploits both players are playing quote unquote perfectly Tens is actually a mixed strategy. It can, that's not tens, that's ten nine. That's also a mixed strategy. But tens is certainly a mixed strategy. It can bet, it can check. And our first question today is to understand how can this be if we need protection? If I need to feed my family, I don't really have the option of not feeding my family. If I need to run away from a hungry lion, I don't have the option of not running away from said lion. So how can we need protection if this spot is actually checkable, right? Is that a gradable thing, needing protection? Can you just a little bit need protection? Surely you need something or you don't, right? And that's why when a human has this thought process, they end up betting. So we can see where the gain of betting comes from. It's kind of natural, right? We get called by lots of worse hands. And when villain folds, sometimes he's folding useful cards for us to make him fold, like Queen Jack. This is his range here. Sometimes the blue is fold. He is folding Queen Jack. And when that happens... That's good for us. Sometimes he also calls with it though, and that's even better, or raises, and that's even better still. So when your opponent invests money with Queen Jack, it's actually better than if he folded. So in a way, can you really need the protection here if you'd rather that hand called you this time, like it's meant to sometimes, right? Presumably not. Another aspect of what's going on here is that when you check, lots of good things happen too, right? So check is a line that's much harder to understand the EV of, and we're going to talk a little bit more now about what checking two tens in this spot can actually do for your game and what it can mean for your understanding of poker just to make peace with the idea that you can check two tens here. It's a perfectly fine thing to do. So let's take a look at some cold hard facts about why this is okay. But firstly, this is a tree. Look, tree. Poker is a tree. When you're on the tree of poker, you are at some point going to be on one of these branches and at other points on other branches. Let's say this time you're on this yellow branch here. That means that right now you care about the things that happen on that branch only. So when you're at the base of the tree, i.e. you're still just on the flop and you're trying to figure out what you want to do with tens in this node on this decision point, you're actually at the very start of the game tree post-flop, right? Okay, pre-flop there's been some decisions, but this is basically the start of the game tree. So 
you're at the trunk. All of these different branches are possible here. They could all unfold with relatively equal probabilities. When you have tens here, your opponent could raise you on the flop. If you bet, he could fold, he could call. If he raises or calls, there's so many different lines that can then happen. Alternatively, you could check the flop and your opponent could check back. He could start bluffing, he could start value betting, he could cooler you, he could bluff off three streets. There's just so many different um, realities that can unfold. So when you say, I need protection, therefore I bet, you're actually just highlighting one random branch arbitrarily and you're doing it because that branch stands out to you. Why does it stand out to you? Like, why are humans so drawn to the idea of protecting what we have rather than earning extra money? Because that's what you can actually do if you check. Some EV comes from making villain invest with hands he would fold to a bet, right? So think about that. So if you bet the flop here, and there's nothing wrong with betting the flop, I'm not arguing for always checking tens here, I'm just trying to show you that the lines are much closer than they may intuitively appear. So if you go ahead and in this hand decide to check, one of the things that can actually happen here when we check is that villain could start bluffing with again, a hand like queen jack off, king ted off, something like that, right? He can make big bets, he can make small bets. As the solver shows here, it's using two different sizes um, at relatively mixed frequencies. Of course, we could simplify this. Um, but yeah, there's lots of hands here that are actually god-awful that start bluffing. Have a look at like queen six of clubs. That hand is meant to start betting almost half the time. If you bet, that hand will just fold. You will make no money from queen six of clubs. It would be a losing proposition for a villain to invest. So it's very important to understand that for your opponent, there are some hands that can only actually invest if you check, and those hands are often very, very terrible. Yes, if you bet, you prevent the turn coming a queen, but is that really a big deal? I don't think so, and we'll explain why in just a second. Next up, though, let's have a look at some other thought processes for why checking might actually be okay, and these may be things that you actually miss. So another reason why checking might actually be completely fine here is that when villain doesn't hit the turn, your equity and EV go up. It's really natural to think about what happens the times we get sucked out on. But remember, guys, there are lots of other branches in the tree, lots of other things that can happen. So let's have a look at what happens when the turn comes what it normally comes, which is actually a more meaningless card. And even when it does come a queen, it's not going to hit your opponent's range all that frequently. It's really not. So what happens then in the solver here when we check the flop, villain checks behind, and then... Well, let's look at our EV to start with on the flop with 10s. So our EV on the flop with two 10s is around 67 chips here. The pot is actually 60 chips, so 10s is entitled to more than the pot. How is that possible? Because we're not talking about equity. We're not talking about how often we would win. We're talking about how many chips we'd make compared to the pot. So basically, we get a bit more than the pot here on average um, when we hold two 10s. Okay, so that's our EV there. Now, if we check and villain checks back, and the turn comes a deuce, which it very often will, our EV goes up to 93 chips. Not only do we still get all of the 60 chips that are currently in the middle, this is a 510 model, right? 60 chips in the pot. We also get 30 more this time. So whenever you check and villain checks back and the turn is a brick, your EV, your expected value in the hand, not just your equity, that goes up too, right? But most importantly, your EV goes up to a point where you are entitled to more of the pot than you were when the flop first came down. People forget this. People completely fail to realize this in their obsession with protecting what they have. And I think this is why the word protection is so harmful. Let's investigate another thought process now that deals with the human inclination to want to protect what we have instead of trying to earn things that we don't have. This is a very natural but harmful way for a human to be. So when you already have most of the pot, it's hard to gain a lot of extra chips by making your opponent fold, right? So if you get your opponent to call you, of course you can gain lots of extra chips and that's why our EV was like more than the pot there with tens, it's a very large number. But consider this, if you already have the green shade of the pie here on the left and your opponent only has the brown shade, it looks like it's ha like three quarters apple pie, one quarter kind of steak pie, disgusting. You're gonna be entitled to so much of the pot that the amount you gain by making him fold his hand, it can only ever be a small amount of the pot. Going from most of something to all of something can never be a big gain. Contrast that to when you're value betting or you're and you're increasing the pot by like four times the size, 
then it's amazing, right? Or you're bluffing and you make your opponent fold 80% of the pot that he had because you had the worst hand. Value betting and bluffing are what we call primary reasons for betting. Protection is a very secondary and sketchy reason for betting. And that's why we should be very careful that we don't overdo it. Far from being able to bet only for protection, protection actually has a very small and meaningless impact on the overall game tree. Let's go back to our Piosim here and see this in action a bit more. Back to the strategy here. When we go for a check, I want to show you some of the other cool things that can happen that make check the same EV as betting here with two tens, even if it doesn't seem intuitive to check. Firstly, your opponent is supposed to open the action 46, I think that makes, about 46.5% of the time here, checking only 53.5% of the time. If your opponent's really passive, of course, you probably just want to do the betting yourself. And if he's really aggro, you actually definitely want to check raise with your tens now. And that's the key, check raise. We get to check raise with this hand. So when we check and our opponent bets small here, we have a mandatory raise. If we look at the EV, it is higher EV with two tens to raise than to not raise. And for that reason, we, without any exploitative considerations in place, we do just want to go ahead and always raise this hand. It's the fact that we are allowed that raise button. Basically what's happening here is yes, when we check on average, the pot stays smaller than when we bet because our opponent doesn't always open it for us. He does check back about half the time. However, when we bet the pot, when we check and he does bet, that branch where, imagine the yellow branch now being the one where we check, he bets, and now we raise, the pot gets even bigger still, and you still get your precious protection, but you get it in an even bigger pot, right? So you protect um, the same amount of an even bigger pot, which is great for you. So yeah, um, far from betting being necessary because you need to protect your equity, actually you don't need to protect your equity because checking and allowing your opponent to bet gets you even more money on some branches and you make back what you would have lost by not getting value. But also if we go back to this node here, this point in the tree, I know it's just a, a place on the game tree, and we look at what happens when it goes check check, we can see that on most turns our equity is very high with tens. So like on the classic sort of five turn or brick turn, we are looking at, I'm going to look at our EV actually, it's the, it's more than the pot. Again, the pot's 60 chips. We're entitled to 66, 67 chips here. Amazing. And even if the turn is something bad, I still want to show you guys what happens. It's not as bad as you would think. Let's say the turn is that dreaded overcard that you're all fearing when you need to protect your hand, right? I'm not saying you're all guilty of this, of course not, but talking to you, you specifically. Tens here is still entitled to more than half of the pot on this turn. Yes, it's dropped significantly, but you have not lost the whole pot, right? There's another human instinct to think that the whole pot is now away from you because a queen came on the turn. Your opponent doesn't always hit that card. In fact, he, he usually doesn't, right? Sometimes you were, you were sort of not in great shape anyway because he had a flush draw. There's other hands that have good equity against you in this sort of flop checks through situation. Um, and there's hands that have really bad equity against you. So yeah, the, when the queen comes on the turn here, and let's say you check your tens and, and villain starts betting, you're still calling for, for half of the pot in EV. So even when your opponent bets, you still make half of the pot because of the times that he's bluffing. So even on this card, it's not like the world has ended. The world only really ends for you when he when both a queen comes on the turn and he had a queen and he would have folded that queen on the flop. Remember, some of the time that the queen is coming on the turn, you're on a branch where he called the flop because he's supposed to call your flop bet with things like queen jack sometimes it's blind versus blind ranges are very wide king queen queen jack off he's meant to raise you here with queen 10 then when he hits the queen in the turn it's way worse because the pot's much bigger now right so the point is there's just so so much more to this game tree than what you would think there's just so much more going on than this one yellow branch that you just happen to have highlighted you've got to expand your horizons and look at the whole tree let's go to another hand now this one is possibly equally surprising or even more surprising than the first example. So in this example, I've actually flipped the script and made Hero the big blind. So we're in the big blind. We call preflop. Again, a single raise pot. Small blind checks the flop over to us and we have 10 nine of clubs. Again, when you look at how often a recreational player slow plays or a beginner or a micro stakes reg or even low stakes reg slow plays this hand on the flop, it's a good deal less than they should. And that creates a lot of exploitative problems for them against solid players who anticipate 
that their checking range will be underprotected and absolutely demolish them on the turn with lots of big betting. But that aside, I'll show you guys why it's actually completely normal to check back in this spot. So let's begin with the idea that when you're in position, there are actually hands you can't slow play. It's not really like that out of position. We'll talk about that at some point. It's, it's another topic. It's to do with how urgent it is for you to build the pot. But basically when you're in position, there are some hands that you are just simply not allowed to slow play in this spot. We can take a look at what some of those hands are. So there will be some hands here that are completely mandatory for in position to bet but they are generally not going to be the 10-9 of clubs, so have a look here. So when out of position checks this flop, again, we have this sort of 45% bet frequency globally with, with range for the big blind here. But when we look at what he's doing with a particular hand like 10-9, it might surprise you that when we don't have the backdoor flush draw here, and even when we do, the EV difference is very small. If you look at the numbers there in chips for betting or checking 10-9 of hearts, there's not much in it, but there's literally nothing in it with 10-9 or diamonds or clubs. Now, this is typical in game theory, that two lines are completely the same EV. Of course, in reality, that won't be the case, and sometimes you can figure out which one will be better. Sometimes you can if your opponent's playing in a strong, balanced way. But if your opponent's, you know, too passive with his checking range, again, you should probably always bet this hand. If he's overprotecting his checking range, you should probably always check this hand. If he loves to check raise the flop, you should probably always check this hand. Um, if he does it a lot with value hands, that is, and not so much with bluffs. Um, and if he's going to, let's say, play in a way where if you check back, he'll make terrible turn bluffs all the time, then you should probably check back, right? So there's lots of things that can influence this in reality. But in theory, objectively, the EV of betting and checking is just completely the same, guys. There's nothing in it. So why is this? Well, firstly, if you bet, you will lose more when you run into a hand that kills you. So if you run into the tens, the aforementioned hand for small blind, you will lose a very big pot. He will raise you, you will defend against that raise with 10-9 because you have to, otherwise you become an enormous net because he's also bluff raising and stuff. Then the turn will come, he will overbet, you will call again um, with this hand or if you do fold, it will be even worse. And then against his range, not against tens. And then when the river comes, he will go all in with two tens and you will sometimes have to call, sometimes have to fold. But either way, you will be in an absolute world of pain. So betting the flop caused all of those bad things to happen on that node. Had you checked back the flop, he would have probably bet turn big. You would have called. He bets river big. You would have called. You lose way less money. Now, that's not an argument for checking. It's not sufficient because there's lots of good stuff that happens when you bet too. But I'm just pointing out that we shouldn't just focus on we need protection. If we just think about protection on the flop, we end up betting, we ignore the branch of the tree where he actually stacks us. So it's just one one example of what a negative branch is in this spot. Also, we can, by checking back, do the same thing that we talked about for, for small blind, and we can actually get villain to bluff some very bad hands. So if the turn is, let's say, a five here, we can get him to bluff queen let's find a combo queen eight of clubs sometimes or something that's just really dead against us let's make the turn something even brickier like a deuce and the point will be stronger and now we can get him to bluff all kinds of random gut shots and just just hands that have very little ev against 10 9 and we make back a lot of a lot of chips just by doing that yeah sometimes when you check back he will hit the turn and he will beat you with a hand that would have folded flop but that's actually pretty uncommon because usually when you bet here and he has two over cards, he actually doesn't fold. He calls a lot of like King Jack here. He raises you here with as a bluff with flush draws, with over cards, with all kinds of backdoor hands. If there's one hand that small blind is absolutely not folding, it's a flush draw, right? So when people first get into the game and they think about protecting their hand against the flush draw, that's an even bigger problem because flush draws call or raise you and they have very high EV against you in the pot. So you gain nothing by betting against a flush draw. In fact, if I could see that my opponent's hand was a flush draw, I wouldn't even be all that swayed to betting 10 9 of clubs just a little bit. So there we have it. Protection basically is a very, very dicey concept. It's one that people overuse all the time and it's one that if you're not careful it can claim a way bigger stage in your thought process than it's entitled to based on its merit so with protection i would first off change it to denial i would say i don't want protection anymore to be a term i want to talk about denial because denial sounds like something extra that you can get i can deny you some equity i can get a bit more of the pot by denying you a bit of the pot it's not like i need protection i must protect my resources remember guys we want to fight that human instinct to protect what we have and remember that stuff we already have is no more significant in poker than stuff we can lose or gain in the future that's a really key point for humans right that stuff i can get in the future matters 
equally if not more than the stuff I've already got in some cases because sometimes it can be three or four times the current pot that I can gain right or lose so that really matters future future EV the other branches on the tree um, and also don't forget checking checking has its own merits it can get you bits of the pot that you don't get by betting it can get lots of EV from the weakest parts of your opponent's range that would fall to your bets as we saw and and all sorts of other benefits on other um, nodes of the game tree also keeps the pot smaller when you're losing so don't i'm not saying check all of these spots always slow play every hand i'm just saying you know calibrate it properly don't let protection claim more space than it deserves quick shout out before we go today to something that is happening in march in march we are going to be running the exploitative version of the Carrot Poker School. The Carrot Poker School is a 10 week course. It's live, it's like a university style thing with interactive lectures, meeting students, sitting around chatting, doing homework, getting your homework graded, getting feedback on an exam at the end of the course. It's very fun, it's very interactive and it brings your game on leaps and bounds. For this course, we actually have a mass data exploitative specialist co-running it with me, a guy that's been crushing using exploits based on mass data for the last few years of his poker career. Um, and we also have obviously myself bringing you the nice PowerPoint slides and the, you know, the, the carrot mascots and all sorts of game theory. We'll be integrating game theory with exploits in this course. We have a few places left if you want to sign up for this or just want to know more about the Carrot Poker School in general. The best thing you can do is contact me, add me on Discord. It's carrots hashtag 9127. Add me there or go through the contact form over at carrotcorner.com. That's another thing that you can do. If you guys enjoyed today's educational poker content, then please do smash the like button and drop us a little comment below. Also, subscribing to the channel will inform you whenever these and other YouTube videos from myself come out. For everything to do with me, Pete Clark, it's carrotcorner.com for all of your poker learning needs. And we'll see you guys on another video very soon. Much love, thank you for watching, and bye for now, peace out.